Thank you for joining the first of a series of webinars we'll be hosting as Bringer Partners, covering key themes and topics that will define a low-carbon future. Uh, my name is Ilesh Patel. I'm the Global Strategy and Markets Lead for our Energy and Resources Industry here at Bringer Partners. Our low-carbon future is here now. Uh, 2021, in our view, is an inflection point, and one need look no further than the fresh government commitments from top emitting countries, the imminent approach of COP26, and a private sector focus on embedding climate change into investment decision making uh, and decisions. 2021 will therefore be, in our view, the year of, of climate action. This is our optimistic view, but it also comes with a warning. Our generation will be the first to feel the full effects of climate change and the last to be able to be able to do anything about it. So 2021 is the year, in our view, when transition must become transformation, where we must deliver on the promises and commitments we've made to a low carbon. Yeah. That context today will be focusing on renewables in Spain, a country that is the heart, that is at the heart of the and at the forefront of innovation in Europe around renewables, merchant risk, and finance. And I have with me today two of our leaders and experts, Pavlos Rikakis, who leads our strategy, markets and advisory work in Southern Europe, and Alexis Davropoulos, one of our key subject matters on the Spanish power market. Together, they will be exploring the fundamentals of the Spanish power market and potential evolution, evolutions 2040, some of the strengths and weaknesses of the market for investors, uh, potential routes to market and how they're evolving, as well as the lessons from Spain and the applications to other and before I hand you over to Pavlos and Alexis, I'd like to thank you again for joining, encourage you to make this an interactive section, a session today by posting questions in the chat. And by all means, please raise your hand virtually using the functionality in Microsoft Teams if you'd like to ask a question outside of the chat. I'll aim to monitor both of these channels and draw you into the discussion during the webinar. So with that said, Alexis, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to hand over to you to begin our seminar today. Well, thanks, Alex, for the introduction. So as uh, Elias already alluded, uh, Spain is one of the EU countries with the most ambitious decarbonization targets. So its renewable capacity is still at relatively low base, especially when you compare it with other countries, for example. Germany has 55 gigawatts of PV and Italy has about 26. But then if we compare the installed capacity today and with the goals from the National Energy and Climate Change Plan for 2030, we actually see an ambition of tripling its solar and storage capacity and almost doubling its wind capacity. So at Beringa, we take these plans as key inputs to our scenarios, but then we evaluate them based on the current market design and current policies. And we do agree with the ambitious PV build out since its lower costs and excellent uh, market conditions actually support this level of capacity. Although on CSP, we don't see this as being as uh, competitive on a purely economic basis. And it's not clear yet how the government is anticipating to bring five gigawatts of this capacity online since the current auction plan is only inc include 500 megawatts. So it will ultimately depend how competitive uh, CSP with storage will be versus PV with storage. But based on the current policies, it doesn't seem to us that it can compete economically. Then uh, regarding wind, given its higher capex and ticket size and also sometimes higher LTOEs, these projects tend to be more difficult to, to finance on a PPA or merchant basis. So they tend to be much more reliant on auctions when you compare to solar. Then, given the volume announced so far for uh, for wind, uh, which is, is 8.5 gigawatts, and the level of demand we're seeing for, for disasters on PPAs, we think that closer to 40 gigawatts by 2030 is a more likely target, especially when you count that almost 10 gigawatts might be able to retire by 2030. Then, on storage, it's still unclear to us as well how the market will deliver this, since there is a significant missing money in the storage business case. So internally, we evaluate the business case for storage as either a standalone merchant, so participating in energy markets and grid services, or co-located with renewables or in auctions. But under the current policies and the current market design, we don't really see them, uh, the government addressing the missing money situation to support the, this high ambitious target of uh, storage in the country. But nonetheless, it's still, in our view, uh, the capacity of renewable and storage would still uh, pretty much double uh, by 2013. Uh, thank you, Alexis. Uh, I think that was a great overview of the capacity outlook uh, for the Spanish uh, renewables markets and the storage market. Um, and in this next slide, um, what we're summarizing are the strengths, uh, weaknesses, opportunities and threats that we see uh, for the Spanish renewables market over the next decade. Um, I think one of the areas that we pride ourselves at Baringa uh, and where we feel that we're able to offer value to our clients um, is the fact that we work across European and increasingly global markets. 
uh, and we're able to assess um, how those different countries compare against each other um, and how that has an impact on uh, development process operations or valuations. Uh, the, some of the um, factors that we're highlighting in these slides are for the Spanish market. And I would like to spend the next couple of minutes just talking about some of those key factors. Um, start, starting with the strengths first, um, we do see the market as having a very favorable supply mix at the moment. Uh, that is because the influence of gas fire generation in Spain is still significant. Uh, and that presents an opportunity for renewables to displace that gas. Um, and then we also have a number of coal and later on uh, nuclear closers as well, uh, which will create more room for renewables to, to enter the market. Um, Alexis, I think, also previously mentioned the fact that the market, uh, especially for solar, starts from a low starting point. Um, and again, that is also beneficial uh, for, for projects. Uh, we also see in Spain very strong uh, and cross-political support for renewables. Uh, and we also see very strong uh, public support as well, some of the uh, highest uh, levels of public support in, in, in Europe, I would say. Um, similarly, we also see a country with very good resources, especially in terms of solar uh, and to some extent wind as well. Uh, the next two areas are really important for developers. Uh, the first one is the availability of land and the other one is around the planning regime. Um, and both uh, contribute to very large projects being developed in the Spanish market. So there is plenty of land available at competitive rates. And we also see a planning regime that today is relatively predictable. Um, I think there have been issues um, in the past uh, few months, especially, and COVID, of course, has not helped. Um, you know, we have seen delays with the public administration procedures. This is not just for Spain, but everywhere in Europe. But uh, that is a, a topic that I think the government is addressing. Uh, and for example, we've seen the government recently um, launching a, an interactive map where you can basically look at uh, where are the, some of the different difficulties in, in getting planning and environmental assessments in, across the different regions. So uh, overall, we do think that the planning regime um, is suitable for very large projects to be developed in the Spanish market. Um, and then some of the other points that I think are also highlighted are uh, the fact that Spain has a world-class infrastructure, not just uh, in renewable space, but across the wider uh, infrastructure space uh, and, and uh, a very strong industrial base too, which is important both in terms of the supply chain, especially for wind, we see a lot of manufacturers being based there, but also in terms of the industrial demand uh, for electricity. And we're going to touch on that uh, topic a little bit later in the presentation. Um, and then finally, another real strength for us is the internalization of the market. The fact that we're seeing a number of new entrants coming to the market uh, that really creates a lot of opportunities um, for more efficient capital allocation um, and uh, you know a, a more efficient market overall. And then if I can also touch on uh, some of the opportunities that we see in the market today. Uh, the first one is obvious one. I think we're all hearing about uh, declining LCOEs. Technology costs are becoming more and more uh, co competitive. Um, uh, the financing environment is also today favorable. So LCOEs are very competitive. Um, I think that can also present challenges for some of the existing assets, of course, what, that has a, a higher cost base, but overall we see this as, as an opportunity. We also see significant opportunities for Spain to improve on its electricity balance. Uh, so we see the Spanish market being able to export electricity, uh, especially, for example, to France, um, and especially during daytime hours uh, when there's a lot of solar in the system, we think that um, that can provide support to, to capture price for renewables. Um, Another real opportunity that we see today in the market is uh, on the next generation EU funds that will come um, to the market soon. Um, and we do encourage clients to have a strategy on this, uh, how, how they can adapt uh, and, and, and um, take advantage of this, of this opportunity. Um, we're, we've all heard, I think, the figures that uh, the EU has in mind. I think they're talking about 750 billion um, of, of uh, funds from the capital markets that they're intending to borrow over the next few years. Um, and that will be split, roughly speaking, 50-50 in terms of loans and grants. Um, we've also looked at the scale of the investment challenge in, in the Spanish market, and we feel that the next generation, next generation EU funds can be very attractive on, on, on that front. Um, so, for example, when you look at the scale of the investment that is foreseen for green projects today, it's about 190 billion euros that is foreseen to be spent uh, on green projects. And we looked at how that compares against the global financial crisis of 2008-2009, and the same figure was 22 billion. So that just gives you a real sense of, um, you know, the, the funding that will be available for green projects. Um, and actually, Spain is very well placed to um, to benefit from that. 
Uh, another two quick areas that we're seeing uh, clients asking us questions all the time is around pan-European auctions and cross-border PPAs. Those are similar in the sense that we think that Spain can benefit significantly from those uh, because we do see Spanish LCOEs as being very competitive. Um, and so the more sort of integration there is at European level, the countries with the lowest LCOEs will benefit from that. Uh, and, and hence, we do think that the Spanish market is well-placed to capitalize on that. Um, and then finally, um, other three areas that we see presenting real opportunities around electrification, um, storage, and I think Alex will touch that later on, and then uh, hydrogen, of course, which is on everyone's lips today. Uh, and then if I can also touch on the weaknesses and threats. So uh, obviously, the, um, the, there has been a very severe impact of, of COVID in Spain today, um, and no one really knows exactly how the uh, economy will recover and what that new economic conditions will look like. Um, historically, there has been political intervention, especially after 2012, 2013. Um, and I think that is also partly linked to the fact that Spain has high retail prices. So politicians um, always feel that uh, they need to be mindful of that fact. Um, I think grid bottlenecks is something that is often uh, talked about. Um, you know, a number of uh, applications are currently on hold. Um, I, I mentioned earlier about the interconnection capacity, and, and I think because of its location, Spain has relatively low interconnection capacity. Um, and then finally, around uh, uh, missing money for flexibility access, and I think Alex touched on that uh, before. And then if I can quickly uh, finish with some of the threats that we see in the market today, uh, I mentioned uh, the fact that the government may intervene. So, for example, we see higher taxation as a possibility um, if there are structural problems in the, in the system. Um, at the moment, we see, apart from BPAs, that there is a bit of a lack of tools for managing long-term price risk. So, especially in the exchanges, if you try to hedge more than three years in advance, there is limited liquidity in the market today. Um, and that is something that, um, you know, we, we need to, uh, to be aware of for today. Um, and then finally, some of the other risks that we're hearing or threats that we're hearing is around shaping. And, and, and we, we're going to touch on that later on. So who, who has the shaping risk, um, especially in PPAs? Uh, potential for curtailment if, if grid uh, bottlenecks are not alleviated. Uh, and finally, what happens if financing conditions become more challenging? And then uh, after Pablo's overview of the key points about investing in renewables in Spain, we'd like now to discuss a little bit about the available routes to market for renewable projects that we're seeing. So three key routes to markets available uh, right now would be renewable auctions, PPAs and off-taker, and merchants. So and all options are interdependent and they actually coexist at reasonable scale. And in Spain, actually, it's the only place in Europe where we see this actually exists at scale for both solar and onshore wind. And costs are some, uh, often very comparable. So just to give a few examples, for example, in Scandinavia, there is almost no auctions. So onshore wind projects have uh, the option of either going uh, via entering the market via merchant route or by PPA. Whilst in France and Portugal, uh, auctions are very much the main option for developers. And then in Italy and GB, uh, the main focus is on auction and a small amount of PPAs, but there is limited merchant options for projects. Then in terms of the route to markets in Spain, they're very much uh, interdependent so that the amount of available projects to come online in a given year will be split so that auctions typically take the priority since projects tend to be less risky and can get, can get the highest amount of debt and the lowest cost of both debt and equity. And also, considering that the current auctions are for 12 years, while most PPAs tend to be for 10 years, this also impacts the overall cost of capital for these projects. Then the PPA route will likely be the next most competitive. And PPA structure and counterparty will be the key differences in terms of returns and gearings you can get, since uh, no two PPAs will be like for like. And the gearing, uh, cost of capital for these projects will ultimately depend on the price sharing mechanism, if it is a base load or base produced, or even the risk grade of your counterparty. Then the final route tends, the route tends to be merchant. So in Spain, we're currently seeing some lenders going as high as 60% gearing for some of the best projects, which is something we don't see anywhere else in Europe. And also wholesale prices are projected to increase in the foreseeable future. And cannibalization, it's still low because of the low baseline of renewables that we're still uh, pre presenting today. And also daytime demand is higher than nighttime demand. So when you combine all these three factors, they actually contribute for a very good business case for merchant project in Spain. Alexis, that's great. I think I've just had one question on um, the um, ability of lenders to lend against merchant risk in Spain. I don't know whether you, Pavlos, have, uh, have a view on that and how you feel lenders are thinking about merchant risk. 
Yeah, so um, what we're seeing, I think, in the market today is that um, Spanish lenders are actually accustomed to, to lending against merchant risk, um, and they're offering pretty competitive rates at the moment. Um, I think there's a question about, you know, to what extent um, that situation will continue. Uh, but today, uh, certainly, the, some of the rates that we're seeing in Spain are much more competitive compared to, for example, some of the institutional investors that we see offering uh, debt financing arrangements in other markets. Um, so I think there is a question, and we've got a slide actually later on in less that kind of looks at um, what are some of the key factors that will have an impact on on the ability of lenders to lend. And of course, you need to take into consideration, you know, the broader macroeconomical environment um, as well. Uh, but specifically uh, for for how the market works today, we are actually seeing strong appetite for, for, for from lenders to 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 finance against medicine risk. Okay, great. I think we'll come on to it. Great, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Alexis. So, um, for, for, uh, for the next few slides, uh, we're, we're going to look in turn into the PPA route, the auction route, and the merchant route in, in more detail. Um, starting with the PPA route first, um, we have been tracking the, uh, the PPA market in Spain since its inception, um, and we have actually seen it to grow um, and, and now become amongst the most active in Europe. Um, I think there's a few key messages that I would like to say um, from this slide. Uh, the first one is that the size of the market today is about 10 gigawatts. So about 10 gigawatts of PPAs have been signed today. Uh, but there are three important uh, considerations, I think, to take into account. The first is that the market today is dominated by solar PVs uh, because on a delivered energy basis, uh, they are able to achieve the lowest LCOEs. Um, secondly, the market today is also relatively dominated by utilities, retailers and energy traders. Uh, so about two thirds of those PPAs have been signed with such entities um, and only about a third or so has been signed with corporates um, or large energy users. Um, and I think the last one is also around uh, the pay as produced uh, concept being as norm. So um, basically at the moment or historically, um, sellers have been able to pass all of those risks uh, to buyers and, and they have been happy to do that. But we're feeling that now the market is kind of coming to a juncture where um, it has reached or it's close to reaching its capacity uh, from that model. And now where we see demand uh, for PPAs coming uh, is from corporates and, and large energy users. Uh, so we do think that that part of the market is really what's going to now drive the next uh, rate of growth uh, throughout the 2020s. Um, we're seeing um, and, and accordingly, that means that the demand for baseload PPAs is also likely to increase because large energy users, especially those parties with very high electricity costs, uh, are also likely to demand uh, baseload PPAs rather than uh, pay as produced PPAs. Uh, so in that context, um, the Spanish government has actually introduced the uh, Fair Gay Fund, um, which is at the moment is at, is set at 600 million euros, 200 million euros uh, um, for the next three years, which effectively aims to remove some of the default risk uh, from corporates and make it easier for them to enter into long term PPAs. This applies to very large uh, energy users in, in the Spanish market. So about 40 terawatt hours of electricity demand is covered uh, from, from those parties. Uh, but that's not just the size of the price for us, because if you if you look at the Spanish electricity demand, there's another 40 terawatt hours of industrial demand uh, and then another 40 terawatt hours of commercial demand as well. So a total of about 120 terawatt hours uh, is the industrial and commercial sector. Um, and so you could easily see that market growing to significant levels. Um, if the appetite of those entities becomes stronger to enter into long term PPAs. Um, and of course, there is also the potential from, for example, government authorities, um, central government or local government to, to also enter that market as well. Um, so we do see that market changing and sort of switching from, you know, dominate from utilities to into a market that is more balanced and certainly a lot more large energy users coming to the market as well. Um, and then finally, another point that I think is important to say is that. Um, we're also seeing the profile discount increasing in Spain. Uh, so we, we ha we've had a number of conversations with our clients on this. Um, by profile discount, I mean the difference between base produced and baseload PPA, basically the, the shaping risk. Uh, so as we're seeing more and more solar uh, energy coming to the market, we're seeing that um, parties are increasingly aware of and, and, and trying to balance that risk. And now we're seeing that the discount uh, between base produced and, and baseload PPA can be six or seven euros per megawatt hour when it was only three or four um, a few, a few uh, months ago. So that is an area for us that is very important to keep an eye on. And it does mean that the players with 
the most diversification in terms of technologies um, and potential geographies will be the ones that are probably better able to cope with that demand for baseload PPAs. Yeah, so now that we've touched on the outlook for PPAs in the market, now I would like to discuss a little bit the current auction scheme. So uh, these auctions were launched in 2020 in order to help the country meet its uh, NECP targets. And it aims to bring uh, at least 20 gigawatts of renewable capacity online between now and 2025 via CFD mechanism. And that, that mechanism can be technology and region specific. So the, the government with this also launched a calendar with the expected capacity for the next five years. And the majority of uh, the current capacity is for solar PV with 11 gigawatts of minimum and then by, followed by wind with eight and a half gigawatts and then uh, 500 megawatts of CSP and 400 of biomass. Then if we focus a little bit on the first auction, which was held on the 26th of January, it awarded three gigawatts of capacity, two for solar and one for wind. But actually, uh, when the auction was first designed, it was meant to be uh, one for solar, one for wind and one for technology neutral solution. But that uh, one gigawatt ended up being fully taken by PV. And at the moment, the calendar doesn't doesn't include any more technology neutral solutions uh, at the moment. But uh, each annual auction will have specific rules that are announced beforehand. So this can be launched for any of the other annual auctions. And it's worth noting that if the goal of the government will uh, still remain just getting the cheaper energy possible, then we would expect solar PV to dominate as it did in the first round. However, if the government is uh, then starting to get concerned about shaping risk and technology diversification, then wind and other technologies such as storage will start to become more competitive. Then uh, again, on the first auction, it was uh, oversubscribed by, uh, well, 10 gigawatts uh, of players bid in and 33 players were awarded a weighted average price of 25 euros per megawatt hour. And those bids uh, ranged from 15 euros per megawatt hour all the way to 29. And in our view, one of the most surprising results was that actually the awarded price for solar and wind, they cleared at very similar levels. And the key reasons for these are that, well, wind projects, as we already alluded before, they tend to be more uh, reliant on auctions. And considering there was no auction since 2017 and now, that has actually led to a, quite a, a huge accumulation of good uh, wind projects. And then when you consider the look ahead, so for uh, wind projects to come online, the PPA and merchant routes tend to be a little bit more difficult. So there was an increasing pressure for these projects to actually win the auctions or just risk waiting for the next one. And then in terms of LCOEs, uh, what I think one of the first points Pavel's already alluded to, there is quite a, a good supply chain in Spain, including a great manufacturing sector serving the energy industry, and that leads to very competitive wind projects. And then also there are some regions in Spain that have really good load factors compared to the average. There's some projects we see in the high 30% in terms of load factor, which is very, very good, and that can actually make up for the higher capex costs. Then one question that we've actually been getting very often is uh, why the auctions cleared at such low prices. And so if we take a little bit of a deeper dive on the auction results, we just like to discuss how the auction prices actually compare with the PPA price we're seeing in the market. So in our view, the players that participate in the auctions, they have some inherent advantages when compared to the PPAs. And once you actually account them all, the price prices are actually very comparable. So if you start with the actual uh, well, the capacity weighted average awarded price, which was 25 years per megawatt hour for a 12 year contract. Then if you account for the fact that actually the players that were awarding these auctions, they would not receive just a 25 years per megawatt hour. They would actually receive their strike price adjusted to the hourly price in the market by an adjustment coefficient, which was set at 5% for solar and wind. So this means that uh, in a given hour, uh, the plant would receive its strike, its strike price plus the delta between the wholesale price and the strike price multiplied by 5%. And just to put this in an example, so in an hour where the basal price would be 35 euros per megawatt hour, therefore the delta between the bids and the basal price is 10, multiply that by 5%, then the player would actually get 25 euros and 50 cents. And then based on our projections, where we see uh, the wholesale prices to increase throughout the next decade, we estimate this actually amounts to about one euro per megawatt hour on top of your auction price. Then, uh, as we alluded before, actually subsidized projects are able to secure uh, higher gearing levels and lower costs of both debt and equity. And also PPA tends to be for 10 years uh, while the auction contract is for 12 years. So these factors combined reduce the WAC available for the project and that in turn reduces the LCOE by three to four years per megawatt hour when compared to a PPA one. Then the next uh, inherent advantage is uh, related to the generation tax. 
So most PPAs tend to internalize the 7% generation tax and actually have uh, adjustment clauses in the contract that, that allow for renegotiation of the price if this tax is removed. And on the other hand, auction projects are guaranteed this uh, auction price for the 12 years, regardless of what happens to the generation tax. So in our internal view, this tax uh, will be removed by 2025. But it's worth noting that the Popular Party in Spain has very recently proposed removing this tax as soon as possible. And actually, the ECJ is meant to rule out on its validity in the first week of March. So this actually can happen even sooner than that. And then when you factor in that these projects are meant to start operating in 2023 or 2024 for wind, it's likely that they, they assume the generation tax will no longer be in place. And once you factor that in, we estimate that that could also reduce the solar capture prices by one to two euros per megawatt hour. Then the final advantage is, uh, well, it's what we call the early, early exit merchant. So although the contract for the auction is 12 years, the actual contractual obligation with the government is a minimum auction energy, and that can happen before year 12. So this minimum auction energy is determined by the government specified load factors times the 12 years of the contract duration. But very competitive plants will likely have higher than average load factors. So based on our, uh, on our calculations, we estimate that some projects can meet this requirement by year nine or 10. And if that's so, that just leaves a merchant tail of two to three years in the end, where actually developers would be able to realize higher capture price in the auction prices. And again, this can amount to one to two years megawatt per megawatt hour throughout the life of the project. And then we, when we add all these together and we compare it with the, the best next alternative to auctions, which would be pay as produce PPA, we get to a range of 31 to 35 years per megawatt hour. And this is very much in line with what we were seeing in the market earlier this year. Thank you, Alexis. Um, so I think we've looked at the outlook for PPAs um, and we've looked at the outlook for auctions. Uh, so this slide sort of summarizes the outlook for merchant projects. And as Alexis said, uh, there's a very clear interrelationship between the, the three routes to market. Um, the first category that we are sort of highlighting there is around fundamentals. Um, but just as important is also to consider how equity and debt financing decisions are made in the real world, um, where of course there's no perfect foresight and the, uh, the range of outcomes um, is, is much wider compared to you know, what you see in an optimization model. Um, and, and of course, the, you know, the real life experience will not quite be as, as linear as, as, as what you know, modeling often suggests. Uh, so we do want to highlight some of those uh, key factors that uh, will have an impact on um, the ability of, of, of projects to achieve merchant financing. So if we start with fundamentals, um, I think we can spend hours on this. So I, I will just sort of list them. Uh, of course, one is around the supply mix, um, which to a large degree is impacted by LCOEs. Um, the Spanish market, as we said before, is, is currently dominated by gas prices, or, or, or I should say by gas fire generation, and hence gas prices and EUA carbon prices have a significant uh, effect on the market. Um, of course, demand also and developments in neighboring markets also have an impact on, on power prices that are being observed. Uh, so all of those fundamental conditions absolutely do uh, need to be taken uh, into account. And then quickly on the equity front and on the debt front, if we start first with the equity, I think Alexis previously sort of described the opportunity cost that exists um, in terms of the decisions that uh, developers will, will, will be facing uh, in terms of how much capacity they want to allocate down the merchant route versus the other two routes to market. Um, and of course, you know, what kind of prices and uh, returns are going to be available in the other routes to market will also have an impact on willingness to go down the merchant route. Um, and in addition to that, uh, players will also have their own portfolio considerations to take into account. Uh, so they will try to have as, as balanced of an approach as possible, kind of carefully balancing uh, the risks and the opportunities in the market. Um, and then finally, another important consideration is around hedging. And I think we quickly touched on that before. Um, so when we often talk about merchant projects, I think the first thing that comes to mind is just selling to the spot market, uh, but that not, may not necessarily be the case. Um, if there are liquid forward products available, for example, on the exchange, uh, let's say, for example, for five years or seven years, then it is an equally valid proposition to hide some of that risk away uh, for, an ex for, for some period of time for some volumes of your portfolio and then sort of follow uh, a careful approach where you allocate risk accordingly. So merchant does not necessarily mean spot. Um, the reason why this is often associated today is because, because of the lack of liquidity in forward products today. Uh, but the two do not have to be uh, the, the same thing. 
Um, and then finally, on the debt side, and I think that goes back to the question that he last, uh, raised earlier, uh, we know that today uh, Spanish banks are, are leaders in Europe when it comes to merchant um, uh, financing, um, uh, financing merchant projects. Um, I think the you know the, the broader macro environment we, and, and how the sector performs will obviously have a you know huge impact on on their capacity um, to provide loans. Uh, things like you know unemployment rate, default rates. You know you can kind of you can quickly sort of consider the whole macroeconomic picture um, and, 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 and think that, you know, this will have an important effect on, on, on debt issuance. Um, and of course, um, lenders also tend to worry a lot about the downside risk. So they will focus particularly on what are the key factors that can uh, drive prices down over the long term. Uh, and that goes back to the fundamentals um, discussion that we we're having earlier. Uh, but then I, th I think I also want to say uh, the fact that we're seeing that the market becomes more and more sophisticated. And that is a trend that we expect will continue over time. Um, so, for example, um, we've seen a lot of innovation in, in recent months in this space of basically replacing the traditional uh, project financing uh, structures with more innovative uh, structures. Uh, so, for example, we're seeing uh, the emergence of green bonds in the industry. Um, we're also seeing the emergence of syndicated loans, um, you know, where basically, especially for larger projects, th those are becoming more and more um, prevalent. And at Barinka, we've had the, uh, the opportunity to be involved with some of those really exciting projects. Um, and another area that we're um, keeping an eye on is um, what's known as synthetic uh, risk transfer. Uh, basically, uh, this is the, these structures allow banks to optimize uh, or recycle capital um, and, uh, on their balance sheets. Uh, and this allows them to increase their lending capacity for the renewable sector. Uh, the way this is done is basically what they're doing is they're transferring the risk of a large portfolio of loans uh, to other financing parties that are willing to take that risk. Um, the loan does remain on the bank's balance sheet, uh, but the risk transfer means that uh, those other parties will share some of the liability uh, in the event of a default. Um, and, and that is quite crucial because basically it, it, it allows banks to hold less regulatory capital um, and hence they can commit more funds into green uh, lending. We haven't seen a lot of those structures in Spain today. We have seen them in other European markets. Uh, but I think once we get that sophistication in the sector in the next few years, we fully expect that the appetite uh, for merchants to provide debt financing um, in the industry will, will increase. Okay, so now that we've talked about DPAs and auctions and now in merchant projects, uh, it's time to tie them all together. And we do expect all these three route to markets to play a part, to play a part in bringing the required renewal capacity online in the next decades. So if we start by focusing on the expected PV build, build out, we estimate that between three to three and a half gigawatts per year, uh, it, it is economically feasible. So we see that uh, auctions will take the majority of the capacity and they would be averaging at the minimum of 1.3 gigawatts a year. But as we've alluded before, this can be increased on each auction as it happened in the last one. Then on PPAs, uh, although we recognize that pays produced are becoming less prevalent, we can still see a case for PPAs to bring online between 500 megawatts and one gigawatt a year in the next decade. And then just given the cost competitiveness of, of PV and the ability to integrate the storage and also its rooftop applications. Then on the merchant component, uh, given the good conditions on the wholesale market and the appetite from equity and debt for these projects that Pablo just described, we can also see between 500 megawatts and one gigawatt of these projects to be built on a purely merchant basis. Now, it's just worth noting that uh, we don't really expect uh, the minimum capacity to occur on a given year for all three routes to market because of how interconnected they are, as we alluded before. For example, we wouldn't expect a PPA maximum capacity to be achieved before exhausting the merchant route. And then regarding wind, we would expect a slightly less ambitious build out of two to two and a half gigawatts per year. And that's mainly given the required ticket size and capex cost, LCOEs, and also time to deploy these projects. So for these reasons, we expect the auctions will be the key route to market for these assets. So representing at least 1.1 gigawatts a year in the next decade. But again, there is potential to increase this on an annual basis, depending on the government strategy. Then on the PPA route, uh, although this has been mostly dominated by PV so far, we also expect wind projects to have an advantage for basal PPAs, which, as we alluded before, we expect to become more prevalent in the future. And then on the merchant projects, we do expect wind projects to be deployed on a much smaller scale than PV on this one. And that's mainly, again, given the higher ticket size and the higher reliance on gearing and lower cost of debt to make this project uh, this project viable. 
Thank you, Alexis. I see some really interesting questions are coming through, so I want to make sure that we've got enough time for Q&A. I will just sort of list uh, some of the key lessons learned from the Spanish experience so far. Uh, so some of the things that we said went pretty well so far. The appetite for PPAs has been really strong. We're seeing lenders increasingly uh, providing debt financing for merchant projects, and we expect more innovation in this space. Uh, we've seen the government procuring uh, there have been some delays in the uh, procurement process, but now are procuring quite aggressively renewable energy capacity and, and setting very ambitious targets. Um, and finally, uh, some fantastic projects are coming through, you know, huge uh, size. Uh, as, you know, we've seen projects as, as, as much as 500 megawatts on the solar space, 250, uh, 300 megawatts is not uncommon. So absolutely fantastic innovation happening uh, on, on the technology front as well. Uh, some of the key issues that uh, to be addressed uh, that we want to highlight here one is the market intervention that uh, caused um, you know, huge worries back in 2012, 2013, and actually really dried up uh, foreign direct investment in the country, um, resulting in 8 billion of, of litigations. Uh, so I think the government is, is aware of that. So, um, and it needs to attract significant amount, amounts of capital uh, in the next decade to meet the renewable target. So that is something that I think they are aware of. Um, Grid applications is another really important one, and we've seen some really sort of speculative behavior taking place in the market. Prior to 2018, you didn't even need, even need a bond uh, to, to apply for grid connection, and that did encourage a lot of speculative bidding, uh, where projects basically, or project developers were amassing uh, grid connection agreements with a view to then sell them to the secondary market uh, without really ever planning to build projects. Um, so. I think uh, the Spanish um, policymakers were a little bit uh, per perhaps late um, um, in, in addressing those concerns, but they are addressing them now. Um, and then finally, just two quick um, other areas that we think are really important. Um, there's, the first one is the, around flexibility assets. So we haven't seen any storage, for example, technology today. Um, and, and so we do await for more clarity from the government on how exactly they want to address the missing money problem for flexibility assets. Um, and the last one is around liquidity that I think we, we already spoke about. Um, so these are some of the areas to, to watch out for uh, when it comes to uh, making sure that the industry is, is, is fit for purpose for delivering on the 2030 targets. Fantastic. Thomas, Alexis, thank you very much. I think we should just uh, get into the Q&A. Um, please post questions. Please raise your hand. Got one here from uh, Lewis at G. says, what are the key factors that will prevent the country from reaching the NECP 2030 targets for wind. Uh, so but what role do you think wind plays and what are the factors that will prevent uh, Spain from reaching its targets in that respect? I can make a start on that one. And I guess some of all well, the main challenges just the scale. So we're talking about almost doubling capacity from 27 gigawatts today to 50. And then you need to account for the fact that almost 10 gigawatts of old wind assets will be able to or be in, in the right time to retire in the next decade. So then we're talking about 35 gigawatts of net addition. And then if you consider that the actual auction volumes that have been announced, there's only eight and a half. So then it's pretty much only one third of the required volume that has the government prepared to support to actually meet this target. And then as we alluded before, the other routes to market in terms of PPA and merchant, they would still provide a good financing route and route to market for these projects. But just it's hard for our city, given in the current market environment and the current policy design, for these other two routes to market to provide the same level of, of availability for projects to come online as auctions. So that's the main reason why we think it will be a little bit lower than what the government is uh, estimating, but still quite an ambitious target. It's helpful. Lewis, did you want to come back on that? Was there a follow-up question from you or should we go to the next one? Uh, no, no, that's that's fine. Thanks. Thanks for the answer, Alexis. Um, so the next question we've got, uh, uh, we've covered a lot here on the growth potential for renewables in Spain, given favourable conditions. Kind of similar question to the wind one. Is there, a, is there anything the Spanish government should or could be doing to unlock even more potential? I guess if I can build on that one, if I think about net zero, um, Pavlov, so, you know, in, and net zero commitments by government, of which we're seeing many now, you know, what would it take to scale beyond 2030 to a net zero commitment? And what would that mean? Do we think, do we think Spain can get there? Um, yeah, it, it's a very good question. And, um, I think, obviously, it, it's not easy to answer for something that will happen 30 years away, but I, th I think they've got everything in place to be able to deliver on that if they act quickly uh, and with force. Uh, but I think what we're finding in our models is that when you talk about net zero, you, lead, you, you really need a lot of technologies that aren't really today commercially viable to come through over the next uh, uh, you know, decades. Uh, so, for example, 
electrifying heat and transport, um, moving very aggressively on hydrogen. Um, and, and so, you know, obviously there is the, the roadmap for hydrogen in particular, for example, where we talk about four gigawatts of, uh, of hydrogen capacity by 2030. Um, but I, th I think in, if, if, if we want to get down to net zero, uh, firstly, the, uh, the, commercial, uh, the commercials needs to work for those new technologies that are not quite there today. Um, and then also the, the, the other comment I would make is around market design as well. Uh, so what we're finding quite often in our, in our models is that the more aggressively you put uh, with your decarbonization objectives, really sort of once you get down to the 40 to 50 grams per kilowatt hour mark, it does become quite challenging then to um, have a, a market that is relatively stable. Um, so you, you can end up with very volatile uh, wholesale electricity prices, which may or may not be politically acceptable. So how exactly uh, policymakers will adapt to that environment? What kind of market design uh, frameworks are going to put in place? That will be really key to develop, um, you know, in, if you want to kind of uh, um, meet your net zero ambitions, because otherwise the cost of capital will just go through the roof uh, because it will be too risky to invest in projects. So I think these are some of the key areas that um, I would want to highlight. First one is that the commercial and the technology needs to work that today isn't quite there. And then secondly, also the, the market design question. Great. And I guess just one follow up and I've got another question to come to you on, on the on the chat here from, from attendees is um, the one I often get asked by our clients is, is Spain a bubble right now from a renewable energy perspective? Is this, is this all going to burst the next year and we're going to end up you know, we're going to end up in another uh, bubble, tech bubble type scenario, or is this going to last and last? Uh, maybe I, I can start with that, Alexis, and then you can, yeah. Uh, so um, I think, so we, we don't think it's a bubble. Uh, we don't think that it will be quite as linear as, as you know, in, in a lot of our modelings, right? In our models, we say, you know, three and a half gigawatts year in, year out, uh, all the way 2030, nice and, nice and simple. It, it won't happen like that. You know, for sure there will be, cycles, um, both from a macroeconomic perspective and from a kind of a risk and, and, and a kind of sector perspective, there, there will be cycles, no doubt. Uh, but we do think that the levels of renewables will be very substantially increased uh, compared to where they are today. Uh, and we also think that Spain will benefit significantly from this increased um, integration with European markets that we were talking about earlier. So there is real upside potential if more and more interconnections are built with France, for example, because you've got access to funds from the European Commission if corporates all over Europe are buying um, electricity, as, renewable electricity as cheaply as possible, then countries like Spain and of course Scandinavia as well will, will stand to really benefit from that. Um, so there, there are, and um, you know, I mentioned also pan-European auctions as well. So cross-border PAs and pan-European auctions can, can, can really provide significant opportunities. So um, we think it, it will be non-linear for sure, and, and there will be, uh, you know, uh, kind of blocks and, and, and stumbles along the way, uh, but. We also think that the country still presents huge amounts of opportunities when you look at the, you know, the, the levels um, that are installed today versus what we think is going to be economically viable over the long term. Great. And a follow up question from the uh, from the webinar attendees as well from Christina. How many gigawatts do you forecast that could sign a PPA until 2030? So what's the what's the projection? What's the crystal ball say for our 2030 PPA indicator? Well. Uh, well, I guess what we're uh, based on what we are seeing in the market and what are according to our modeling can reasonably say between one to to do to two gigawatts a year for the next the next decade. That's between both solar and wind. But it's just important to highlight the various I guess forces at play that Pavel described earlier. Uh, like the utility PPAs have been pr the primary driver in the last three years, and we mm -hmm. expect this to be a massive shift uh, starting in the next well starting from now. And then we don't know exactly how uh, material that shift is going to be. We still expect them to play a significant force in the PPA market, but exactly how much it's still something we're waiting for the market to develop it a little bit. And then also on the corporate side, I mean, as Pablo alluded already, the potential for uh, tap, uh, tapping in the commercial industrial sector in Spain represents 120 terawatt hours a year. So that alone would be a lot more than the one and a half to two gigawatts we we're just describing. Now it depends how quickly and how material for these corporates actually assigning a PPA will be. And I guess it will depend on how the importance they'll place on the traceability of their energy, uh, the renewable electricity. And we even see some players putting at a huge amount of uh, importance, not only in their own electricity, but also in their whole supply chain. So that could play a massive part. And then also a lot of uh, corporates are putting an increasing uh, importance in the additionality factor, meaning that they can actually claim that a specific wind farm, a specific solar farm came online because of them, because it's a huge PR benefit. 
And then the final one would be in terms of uh, well, the cost security and the cost reduction if the PPA is negotiated appropriately. So all these four factors will play a huge part in how the corporate PPA market will develop. And it's something that we're monitoring closely, but we, we feel like our one to two gigawatts a year is a very reasonable target. That's it. It's really helpful. And there's more questions coming along. I, I'm through more than welcome, Amal, if you want to ask a question yourself, I'm more than happy for you to I, I'm, uh, avoid reading out your question and more than happy for you to ask it. Uh, thank you, Lesh. How are you? Good, thank um, you. Thanks, gentlemen, for the introduction. I, I, my question is, um, uh, is we're looking at uh, the hydrogen as a uh, as a uh, energy vector. How much of that plays a role in the Spanish government plan achieving the target in 2030? And how much does that has taken the interdependency between hydrogen and renewables into that consideration? Thank you. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a really good question. Maybe I can start with that and Alexis, uh, yeah, please feel free to add. So um, what we're seeing with hydrogen is that there is ambition from the government there. Um, and I think it's quite interesting that basically Europe starts from a position that they think we're going to be an importer of hydrogen over the long term. So there could even be a lot more potential than what kind of Europe realizes if, if, if those uh, technologies become commercially viable. Um, so the current ambition uh, from the Spanish government is for four gigawatts of electrolyzed capacitors uh, by 2030. It is not exactly clear yet which applications are going to drive that growth. Um, certainly we see uh, in the industrial sector, we see some of the best potential, especially for example, for steel. Um, we also see significant potential for um, even in the power sector, in the transport sector, um, et cetera. Um, so it's that, that Will depend basically that will have an impact on the on, on, on the flexibility that the um, those electrolyzers uh, would offer to the to the market, and will have an impact on electricity consumption. Uh, so, I mean, I, th I think the best figure we can give you is that this four gigawatts probably tra translates about 15 terawatt hours or so of electricity. So, in the grand scheme of things, it's not a you know I don't want to call it I don't want to call it the game changer because you know of course it is important but it's not as important as some of the other drivers. Um, you know, for 15 terawatt hours is is great. You know, and and the more we can make sure that hydrogen is is proven commercially and technically, the better. Uh, but you know, for, if we're just talking about 2030, um, then you know it's not it's not the end of all. You know, that it, it's not going to be the single driver that will or factor that will determine whether Spain meets the targets or not. Post that, post that says, yeah, absolutely, hydrogen has a critical role to play uh, to 2050. We still haven't seen a, a pathway to 2050, uh, so we, we need to, uh, to watch out for that. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I, th I think that's yeah, that, that's my comment. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. No, I would just add a small comment on your uh, point that actually the industry will play a huge role in this. And actually some of the key or more advanced hydrogen parts we're seeing in, in Iberia are actually very much targeted to the industrial sector. For example, there's a, a big project called Orange Bat, which is focused on Valencia, which has something like 90 to 95 percent of the ceramics industry in the country. And they're going to basically sign off take agreements with several of the producers there exactly to be well, pretty much a sink for the green hydrogen that will be produced from those from a massive renewable plant. And there, there's a similar project as well in País Vasco, which is also meant to harvest a, a huge potential of the wind capacity in the sector, also to target a specific industry located in that region. So we see a lot of these offtake agreements targeting specific pockets of industry to become a huge uh, driving force for the, the uptake of uh, hydrogen. It's a great point, Alexis. And um, you know, some of our strategy work on our hydrogen, we've also highlighted Spain as an attractive market potentially for green hydrogen to ammonia, particularly for the agriculture industry. Uh, as an end user. So I think there's some really good use cases on hydrogen, which um, I know we're exploring with many of our clients, looking at the economics and returns available for investment, both in renewables and the hydrogen electrolyzers. And of course, thinking about the customer economics there. Uh, Thank other uh, thanks, Amal, that's a great question. Um, please others feel free to put yourself off mute and ask a question. Yeah, this is, hello. Uh, this is Aurelio Munoz from Barcelona. Um, Asking you, how, how relevant do you think will be the integration of uh, flexible assets, the batteries, with wind generation to create a hybrid model and uh, the impact that, that this has on the economics and the business case? Yeah. Uh, um, again, let me uh, start by answering that and then guys, please repeat to in. So, broadly speaking, we see three business models for flexibility assets, let's say for battery storage. 
Um, we see standalone storage, um, especially to provide arbitrage. Um, we also see co-location, which is a, a, the, the business model that you're referring to. So co-locating storage together with renewable assets, for example, it can be wind or it can be solar, um, and, and that can result in significant cost savings um, and, and, and an overall reduction in the profile um, of, your, of your combined portfolio. And we can also see um, later on potentially auctions. So if, if, for example, they have auctions specifically for storage assets, where you will do a combination of uh, arbitrage and provision of system services. Today, we don't really see any of these three business models really working, uh, unfortunately. Um, just the economics are not quite there yet. You either need to believe in extremely uh, extreme sort of cost reductions on the technology front, or um, you need to believe that the, the, the government will um, reform two, 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 two markets. The first one is the capacity market, which doesn't quite exist today. Um, there is a possibility that it will be introduced, uh, but it doesn't really exist today. And the second is the ancillary service market. Uh, so unless those markets are reformed, uh, then we think that those business models will be delayed. Um, potentially sort of in the mid 2020s uh, or so is when we start seeing that the, that the economics are up. Uh, so to answer your question, um, we think that it has a role to play. Um, it will take some time. And, and the other important factor to consider is also greed. Uh, so where we see that those business cases being the best is in pockets of the network where there are real greed constraints. And for example, you're having to curtail your renewable assets. And rather than doing that, you would rather um, install a battery. Uh, but that's not quite what we're observing in the market today. So there, there is some grid element, but not to the point that it would make, make the economics of co-location attractive. Great question, Aurelia. And uh, it looks, sounds like uh, the battery storage really surprised me as well. And how you're going to balance all that wind on solar and uh, in a isolated system as well that lacks interconnection with the rest of Europe. That's not something Pavlos you said, right? Um, Let's come back to that if there is uh, if there is time, but uh, I want to make sure there's a chance for others to ask questions. Okay, and please just feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. If there's not, or whilst people are thinking, Pavlos, I think I'd like to come back to that interconnection example and and what what our view is of how interconnection between the Iberian Peninsula uh, and the rest of Europe will progress over the next few years. What, what's our view on interconnectors? Yeah, so it's one of those things that geography plays a, a, a huge role. Uh, and so if you want to build an interconnector, effectively, you either have to go subsea or via the Pyrenees. Um, and, and there are three projects. One of them is pretty much under construction, two more under development. Um, but those projects are very expensive. So um, the Biscay Golf project, for example, that is basically under construction uh, is, is two billion euros. Uh, so it's a two gigawatt project, you know, very large size, but, but quite expensive. Um, and so it will depend on support from consumers, uh, or at least underpinning, I should say, of, of, from consumers. Um, we do think that there is a pot potential to definitely increase um, uh, interconnection capacity, and the economics will stack up in the long term. Uh, but you know, those are pretty expensive projects. Um, and you know, in a world with low interest rates, then that's great because some of those projects actually can get financed. And like we said before, with things like, for example, the next generation EU projects of common interest. There is a lot of uh, funding available at European Commission level, which actually may mean that those projects get uh, built earlier. Uh, but if the financing conditions become more difficult, then uh, you know some of those projects may may be delayed. Uh, but broadly speaking, we, we do see that um, six or or eight gigawatts of interconnection capacity could easily be developed more um, uh, between Spain, Spain and France. Fantastic. And just another question here from uh, from David Boylan: Does grid charging? You know, kind of like in the UK, present barriers, or does it enable the development of renewable generation in Spain? Like grid charging, grid access, Pavlos and, and Alexis, how, how much of a constraint is that on new development? Yeah, I can make a start on that one. I guess as Pavlos uh, alluded before, and the actually getting access to grid has been one of the key bottlenecks for the deployment in Spain. As Pavlos alluded before, the fact that there were no uh, bond requirements uh, in the beginning led to a huge bottleneck in projects, and that basically that kind of delayed the actual uh, progression of viable and good projects. So that has been a huge, uh, well, a huge hindering on the Spanish development. That's something that the government has tried to address with the, their latest royal decree last year, trying to impose very strict milestones so that the actual speculative projects that would not be able to meet them were, well, had the opportunity to drop out. And we see this as a key milestone that actually it should, in, in theory, just, uh, I guess, 
improve the business case for actually proper projects to, to come online. Although we haven't really seen the, this actually materializing in a reduction of half of the project being speculative. I think there was a good amount of 20 to 30 gigawatts of projects that uh, dropped, but still, we still have a huge pipeline of 130 gigawatts. And it's not clear yet how uh, these will be for, uh, streamlined across. I mean, one thing that we uh, didn't allude before is actually one other benefit that the auctions uh, awarded players got was that actually their application was somehow streamlined past the, the whole uh, grid approval process. So that could also have a play a part. But with regards to the other 120 gigawatts of uh, capacities on the line, that's something that the, the TSO is still struggling to actually find a way of managing it efficiently. That's fantastic. Great. Look, I think we're approaching the end now. Uh, it's been uh, really useful. Some great questions there as well. Um, unless there are any other burning questions, I think. Uh, in closing, I think some really good thematics that we've explored there. You know, Spain remains an attractive, high growth women energy market. It's at the forefront of that kind of low carbon future, including the role of industrial uh, and other customers. The economics for renewables remain strong. That value wedge we always talk about between where wholesale prices are, often in gas driven markets, whereas where the LCOE or renewables are remains a good gap between there. So the opportunity is strong. Uh, some questions around storage and liquidity. I think those are really good ones to pick up on is and hydrogen, I think, as well. You know, what are the role of beyond renewables? What's the role of um, uh, what's the role of storage and hydrogen? And um, I think today it's been fantastic to see so many industry colleagues and clients on the webinar today as well. So please do get in touch with the with the Beringer team speaking here today if you have any further questions or want to follow up any areas of interest or indeed want to subscribe to any one of our market reports. Um, the next seminar uh, in the series will be on corporate PPA. So we're going to pick up on a theme on corporate PPAs in Europe, State of the Union and where next. And we're really lucky to have um, Dominic uh, Ritter from uh, the European Investment Bank uh, join us for that session as well, who's been a co-sponsor of a piece of work we've done with Europe, the European Investment Bank on, on corporate PPAs and commercial PPAs in Europe, which have been a, a landmark study. So we'll, we'll be able to be we're going to provide a, a really good insight uh, into that work and some of the conclusions from it and uh, and the European Investment Bank's perspective on, on how to aid the development of that market. So that's going to be really exciting on the 5th of March. I look forward to seeing as many of you as we can then. Thank you very much and we'll close the call.